something like going to gearbox so we came straight to the garage we're changing out the, what they call the whole back half of the car which will include the gearbox axles brakes everything we uh, had an incident leaving the pits where one of the drivers kissed the wall we took out the right rear wheel and tire and we started having more aggressive tire wear on the right rear than we had earlier we went back to the garage replace the control arms, upper and lower, realign the car, put a new tail on it. This is a race, you just can't have that kind of stuff going wrong. The driving was excellent. We never put the car off the road, nothing. Everything was good there. The driving execution was good. It was just a couple of the minor parts. Once you bring the car in here and set around for 30 minutes, uh, it's gonna be pretty tough to get back. There's not much more you could do, but what we did, it's just one of those things that happens in racing. Redemption. It's a logical and all-consuming quest for anyone who experiences defeat. Level 5 Motorsports Pursuit of Redemption begins some 2,500 miles west of Daytona in Southern California, in the shadow of the San Gabriel Mountains. In 2009, for the first time, Level 5 entered a Daytona prototype car in the Rolex 24 at Daytona, a grueling 24-hour race that pushes both man and machine to their absolute limits. After an unsatisfying ninth place finish, the team has vowed to return to Daytona in 2010 and leave with a different result. Level 5 owner and driver Scott Tucker is fully aware of the challenge his team faces. You've got drivers from all over the world that participate. I mean, these are the best of the best, the best teams, the best cars, the best drivers. Uh, so. You know, it, it, to win the race or even really get to the podium is, is quite an accomplishment. And that's our goal. We'd like to be on that podium. Competing primarily in the Ferrari Challenge, the Sports Car Club of America, and the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series, Scott Tucker has more than three dozen victories in a relatively brief career. Applying lessons learned from his business success, Scott surrounded himself with the best talent in racing, like David Stone, a former Porsche team manager and a consistent winner for more than two decades. David serves as team manager for Level 5 Motorsports. I would uh, define him uh, as the consummate uh, racing team manager. We wouldn't be sitting here today without uh, you know, what he brings to the table. I've never seen a driver more dedicated to his passion and to develop his ability in a race car than Scott is. For the team's second driver, David Stone recruited an old friend, Christophe Bouchou. The veteran French driver has won the 24 Hours of Le Mans, the total 24 Hours of Spa, and the Rolex 24 at Daytona. He's probably in the world among the elite endurance drivers there are. We uh, started racing together about two years ago, and you never know how those relationships are gonna go. And uh, fortunately for this, this one, uh, it's worked out really well. I get on this great ball. <laughs> it's a really great atmosphere inside the team, and for me, after all the season I did, it's uh, why I decide to, for the moment, to stop almost everything in Europe and to focus on this new team, and in order to try to build and to make something here. After just one podium appearance in the Grand Am Rolex series in 2009, the team will once again play the role of underdog as it competes against some of the world's best factory-sponsored teams in the most prestigious endurance race in North America. 
searching for an edge that will bolster his team's chances in the 2010 Rolex 24, Scott Tucker is reminded of his youth and the first car that captured his imagination. To this date, the distinctive sound of a Ferrari engine has yet to be heard from beneath the hood of a Daytona prototype car. Level 5 Motorsports hopes to change that. The Ferrari engine from the Genesis, I mean, from, from its start, is a pure racing engine. The, all the other engines in the Daytona prototype class, aren't, they weren't built as racing engines. The Ferrari, it, came, it, it comes to you as a race engine. So with that and all the other things that we learned, we think it, it'll, it'll be very competitive. Steve Dynan has built BMW racing engines with unparalleled success for more than 30 years. But he, too, has an affinity for Ferrari. So when Scott Tucker approached him about building a Ferrari racing engine, he did not need to be persuaded. We got very excited about this racing project and fell in love with the cars and the technology in the cars and understand why people are so passionate about Ferraris. So we've uh, decided to move ahead with Ferrari performance models, Dynan Ferraris. For Dynan, a former race driver himself, that means reinventing the wheel, or in this case, the engine. But first, his newest creation must show it is reliable enough to survive 24 hours at top speeds, something many engines simply cannot handle. Just six weeks before the 2010 Rolex 24, the team will spend six long December days testing the performance of two Dynan Ferrari engines a four and a half and a five liter displacement, both modified for the Daytona prototype. We're here at Fontana to put as much time on both of these engines as we can and see how they hold up, see what the durability is like, and then hopefully come away from here um, with, the, with the decision that we're gonna go ahead to Daytona and run one of these Ferrari engines this year. That may be a lot to ask, however. When Steve Dynan was developing his BMW racing motors, he went through six engines over a two-year period before he reached perfection. And that's a low number when compared to most new engine programs. But before it can prove its worth, first, the engine must start. Over an eight-hour period, the crew tries more than two dozen times to get the engine to start and idle. The day will come to an end with no resolution to the problem. But the Fontana experience is about much more than the inner workings of two engines. It's about the internal chemistry of a young racing team that is about to undergo a radical transformation. In 2010, Level 5 will bring two 520 horsepower purpose-built racing machines to the big dance with two new engineers and six new drivers. Later that night, with the car's immediate future still uncertain, the newly reorganized Level 5 team meets for the first time. The meeting is led by Graham Taylor, a veteran of Formula One racing who will make his debut with the Rolex 24 as engineer of the number 55 car. For sure, I'm motivated to get the Daytona 24 hour on my CV. Uh, the, the car that races there, you know, the, the fast car that races there at the moment is the Daytona prototype, so I need to learn as much as I can about this car during this test and the Daytona test uh, uh, the first, second weekend in January. Uh, and that's my motivation at the moment to, to gel with the team, bring my experience to their organization, work with the drivers, and, uh, and make the car go as fast as, uh, as I can. Graham Taylor's disciplined style and no-nonsense approach are evident from the start. In the afternoon on Sunday, I want to run all the drivers through the car, so we want to be up and running with live pit stops, proper, proper pit stops Sunday afternoon. Um, may throw in a few curved balls at that point, like nose changes or um, back in after a stop or whatever, but we want to get to Daytona as prepared as we possibly can. There's been a massive investment here uh, from Level 5's point of view to make sure that we're ahead of the game. Um, and I'll try and keep it on a straight and narrow. Jeff Brown, the engineer for the number 95 car, will compete in the Rolex 24 for the 21st time. He finished second in 1997, but is still chasing his first Rolex 24 victory. 
it sounded like a great opportunity with a you know a well-run team and I've, I'd, I'd been competing against them over the years and uh, I think I'd rather race with them than against them. To complement these experienced and proven engineers, Scott Tucker and David Stone have assembled a dream team of superstar drivers. The plan is for Scott Tucker and Christoph Bouchou to drive both cars at the Rolex 24. In addition, six of the best drivers in the world have been recruited to fill out the roster. Four of them have been flown in to test the new Ferrari engines at Fontana. Richard Westbrook, a Porsche factory driver from London, is a two-time Porsche Super Cup champion and just two months earlier won the FIA GT2 title. For me, it's the way my career is going. I want to make the step into prototypes and I'm really grateful for Level 5 for giving me that opportunity. Another Porsche driver and Richard's teammate for most of the FIA GT season is Frenchman Emmanuel Collard. Manu was part of the three-man team that won the 24 Hours of Daytona in 2005. To win a race like this, you, you need to, to have no, absolutely no problem, just fuel and tires and no problem on the, on the track, in the traffic. You have to be really um, concentrated in traffic, especially. And uh, of course, no problem, me no mechanical problem if you want to win. American Ryan Hunter Ray, Rookie of the Year at the 2008 Indianapolis 500, comes over from the IZOD IndyCar Series for his fifth attempt at the Rolex 24. I'm very impressed with what they've done here. Uh, everybody on the crew is really working hard to make this happen, so when it comes down to it, um, there'll be a lot of pressure on us to, to get this win. And Sasha Mawson of Germany an American Le Mans series champion and Porsche factory driver has won two GT class titles at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. This year, the 24 Hours, the biggest challenge will be that we have a new engine that is very, very promising, but it has not promised to be good over the distance. So that's the only thing that is questionable, but uh, you know, it's important for a 24 hour race that the engine runs for 24 hours without any hesitation. The track goes hot at 7.30 a.m., but the car is still in the garage. Despite their best efforts, the team has yet to get the Ferrari engine to idle. With the throttle bodies that are on the car and the linkage, and I believe probably the throttle position sensor, they need some fine-tuning and adjustment. Um, the driver was having a bit of trouble uh, just moving away from a, from a standstill. And uh, I think the engineers are working on that, and it, it sounds to me like they've made a lot of progress. The bigger thing will be for the, to see that these engines get as many miles on them as we can. After four more hours of emergency surgery, the ignition issue is finally resolved. The Fontana test can begin in earnest. Christophe Bouchou takes the five-liter Ferrari engine for its first run on the modified two-and-a-half-mile road course at Auto Club Speedway. Christophe Bouchou spent most of the morning in it, uh, fine-tuning the drivability issues. The key thing is the motor's still out there going round and round with no real hiccups. Scott Tucker is the second driver to experience the new engine. After going to great lengths to take Ferrari where it has never gone before, the results are reassuring. It seems a lot quicker in first through fourth gear than the, the BMW engine we drove last year. Uh, quite a bit quicker, I noticed it right away. And we've just finished uh, Scott Tucker's second run, which was very good, nice and consistent, uh, reasonable lap times, nothing wrong with the car, nothing wrong with the engine. Sasha Mawson is the third driver to climb inside the cockpit, but he doesn't get very far. The engine really, really, really was really good. We had only one issue, and that was not even related to the engine. It was a driver issue, uh, burning a clutch when leaving the pits. I won't say who that was, but anyway. Hours later, the car returns to the track with Sasha Mawson back in the cockpit. He turns in the fastest lap of the day and the highest speed at more than 180 miles per hour. We ran about 380 miles today, 137 laps. Uh, we've got good fuel mileage numbers to start working with, and we'll start uh, seeing where we can improve on that. Uh, I'd say we walked away with a really good, productive day. It's 8.09 a.m., Sunday, and the Ferrari 
is back on the track. For Jean Marchioni, Level 5's technical director, the melodic, high-pitched hum of the engine echoing off the speedway walls means one thing. For the moment, at least, his work is done. Everything is a challenge because in racing, many people talk about planning and things like that, but so many things change minute by minute. Like the car is going around the track right now, everything is running good, like you can hear it. But uh, in a, it can be like in the next corner, the car is off the track and we have to, to change things, to repair things. And uh, it's, as we go, we, uh, we make it happen. Jean Marcioni's break soon comes to an end. With Ryan Hunter Ray behind the wheel, the first Ferrari engine bites the California dust. I was just on the back, uh, or actually the middle straight here. Um, just straight line, first, second, third, fourth gear, and then fourth gear, and it just felt like the bottom dropped out of it, you know, made a big noise, and it sounded like a grenade went off, and that was it. Big hole in the, in the side of the block. We've got uh, bits and pieces coming out the side of the crankcase on the driver's side of the car, and um, in all likelihood it lost a rod, uh, may have lost something else first. So it started out push. I just couldn't wank. I, I couldn't and hustle the car as much as I'm used to. Because of that engine, yeah. non engine braking yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then over here in, this, in the twisty bit, you'd get it yeah. turned, and then the rear would overreact. And you'd get it turned, and the rear would come out. And, it, you know, it just kept, there's a section, a bunch of lefts. Yep. yep. All through there. It's, Did that get worse as the run went on? Yeah. A lot worse. Dusty Renteria, Steve Dynan's race department manager, shares his befuddlement with Jean Marchioni. I'm curious, frustrated, mad, everything else. So I don't know, we'll see. Just have to look into it a little more. You know, it's part of, uh, of why we are here. We have to, to, to do these kind of things. No, uh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, it's, uh, I, I hope everybody's as, as understanding as you because oh, yeah. it's. Uh, it's a difficult thing to stomach at it's the time, part, but it's part of a growing pain when you you come up with a new engine. Yeah. It's, uh, I know things we have to go through. <laughs> yeah. Even though this is uh, a disappointment and it's unfortunate, we'll now uh, uh, move to take this engine out, put the four and a half liter engine in, as as planned. It'll just be early, and uh, carry on with the test. The Dynan engineers feel the second engine should be run for no more than 300 miles, then taken apart and examined. But as his 18-hour day comes to a close, that's not what David Stone wants to hear. Well, nobody discussed it with me, and I can tell you that we came here to test and endurance test these motors, and I would not run this motor in a 24-hour race or even think about taking it to one with only putting 300 miles on it. There will be no other opportunity to test this motor other than at the official test in uh, January, where you only get very short sessions. So. That's not an option. We need to know that this motor will either stay together for as many hours as we can actually get on it here at Fontana or, or pull the plug on running the Ferrari at Daytona and run two BMWs. The Dynan and Level 5 crews work well into the night. The 4.5 liter engine is installed and ready by mid-afternoon Monday, day four of the Fontana test. The car is on the track for 80 minutes before the team calls it a day. The drivers, eager for more time behind the wheel, are anxious for tomorrow to arrive. But during the night, something unexpected happens. It rains in Southern California. Until 7.30 the next morning, the team loses more precious time. Team manager David Stone and others drive their rental cars on the track to speed up the drying process. More than three hours behind schedule, the second Ferrari engine returns to the track piloted by Christoph Bouchou. Its performance is encouraging, but when Scott Tucker settles behind the wheel, the car refuses to cooperate. Clearly it was, uh, the gearbox was hung up between two gears and uh, we pulled the uh, cartridge out of the gearbox and found that there was a uh, broken magnet uh, in there that and they're in there to pick up uh, shavings and filings and things to keep them out of the, the oil and from getting into the other gears. Uh, unfortunately it broke and it uh, led to jamming these gears. So we'll take care of that and uh, we'll certainly uh, take steps to prevent that from happening in the future. In racing, the obstacles are as plentiful as the grains of sand in the California desert. For David Stone, 
Seeing the oil can as half full is more than a personality trait. It's a survival mechanism. That's the way I always look at testing. Any day I'd rather have a failure of an engine or a part or a crash or anything prior to the race. Um, you never like to see this stuff, but that's how you, you learn to prevent those things in the future. So uh, it's, it's all about being optimistic and seeing the bright side of the situation and learning from it and taking that knowledge and going forward and, uh, and uh, having a better car and a better team. With Scott Tucker behind the wheel, the four and a half liter engine records the fastest time to the Fontana test. It is nearly three seconds per lap faster than its big brother. And then it was over.